morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Kyla Murphy Show, Uniquely Different, where we like to celebrate family, community, Christianity, and business. We know that we come together to gel, to grow, earn, and learn. We're very excited about the show today, and we're going to be focusing on poetry. We know that poetry is an imaginative awareness of experiences which are expressed through meaning, sound, and rhythmic language. We know that there are different types of poetry. Um, there are similes where our people compare things. There are metaphors where people suggest direct comparisons without using the words like or as. We know that there are hyperboles which is an extreme exaggeration used to make a point. There's alliteration, where two or more words that start with the same sound or letter. There are other types of poetry, and we're excited that we're going to hear from some of the best poets today. There are also types of poetry called haiku in the Japanese culture, and haiku is formed with three lines um, and it rarely rhymes. So the first and the last lines, they have five syllables and the middle line has seven syllables. It usually uses sensory language to capture a feeling or an image. We sometimes hear about ballads, which is another poetic form. That is a part of the European folk tradition where there is repetition and it often makes us think about music. That came about around the 18th century or so. And then we know about sonnets. Sonnets are like the famous poet William Shakespeare. And it's a form of expressive thought or ideas. And it's made up of about 14 lines, each having 10 syllables in length. So to say the least, we are excited to have some amazing poets with us this evening. We have people with us that are not strangers to the Carla Murphy Show, uniquely different, and we will have a special guest later on in the show. But we're excited about what's to come. We know that Mr. Martin Bryant, he found it in the midst of it all. He's been a poet for over 25 years. He wrote his first poem um, in the series In the Midst of It All around June 8th of 2004. Mr. Bryant is a husband, he's a father, he's a friend, and he's an amazing poet. He's going to share some spoken word tonight. So Mr. Martin Bryant, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us in the midst of it all. Take us higher. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having me on the show, asking me. You know, we always gonna do your show no matter what. Um, this is uh, National Poetry Month. Yes, So when you asked me to do poetry, it was kind of like, yes, finally. In April, can do some poetry for National Poetry Month. And the last time I was on your show, you um, made a request for the uniquely different poem. Wow, you remember. I remember it. So I hope you like what I wrote. Thank you. Uniquely different. It's spelled like it sounds. One may operate different as long as it's on solid ground. I followed the 66 books of instruction filled with hope, inspiration, and rules. Some assembly required though, but God always supplies the tools. Uniquely different. So sometimes a square peg does fit in a round hole. We must think outside the box at times, mind, body, and soul. Different, unique. There are times when I knock, times when I seek. Sometimes poor in spirit knowing the earth is inherited by the meek. Uniquely different. Let me tell you what that means to me. It's being a piece of a large puzzle and fitting independent but perfectly. Definition B, sharing my unique gifts very differently. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Mr. Martin. That was awesome. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> 
So thank you so much for sharing Uniquely Different with us. And I know that you have such a repertoire of all of your poems. And so do you have anything else you'd like to share with us? I sure do. And this one is, I actually was going to wait and do one and just flow off of what everybody else said. But I actually wrote this one. Oh, wow. And this goes with the times that we are in right now. I love it. Guilty verdict. Guilty verdict. Guilty. But why do we celebrate? 72 hours passed and we had at least three more shootings to debate. Now we're new six or seven to deliberate. Six or seven more that talk about blue and black hate. All around the world, the same song. Am I wrong? What you really want from a brother? I got my hands up. Whoa. This isn't a gun. It's a cup. Some things you can't take back, whether the front or the back. Compliance, defiance. What happened to the United Alliance? You know, liberty and... Liberty and justice for all? Well, it seems just us fall in the midst of it all. Whoa, sometimes I'm shocked, G. It's like the Great Depression, they don't know who we be. We are queens, we are kings, jacks, ten of diamonds, we do great things. In the midst of it all, in the midst, they want us to fall. But in the midst of this and that, I look up to who I call. We are kings, we are kings. Whether spaded, clubbed, or brokenhearted, we do great things. We are losing too many heroes, both known and unknown. Our cameras are tired of recording the hate. When is the love going to be shown? You did it again. I like it. I like it. Thank Guilty you. Thank verdict. you very awesome. much. Awesome. Where are your hands? Up. Oh. So Mr. Martin, let's talk a little bit about your poetic experience. What made My, you okay. want to become a poet? Oh, that's a tough question, but uh, easy answer. In 90, 91 to 95, I wrote everything that a writer can write. I've written movie scripts. I wrote and self-published books. I wrote essays, of course, in school. Um, News articles. I had a couple of news articles published in the Buffalo News back in 93, I think it was. And the last thing that was on my plate was poetry. And the funny thing in grammar school and in high school, I never liked poetry. I thought that it, I, I thought it was corny. I'm like, men don't write poetry. But one of my favorite poets is Robert Frost. And I read him in uh, eighth grade and ninth grade. So one day I was sitting on the edge of my bed with a yellow legal pad and a paper mate pen. And I said, I'm going to try to write a poem. And I think the first few years, they were all love poems and I didn't share them. I just, I just wrote them. And it wasn't until 99 when I went to Houston, Texas and went to an open mic. And I said, oh, I can come back to Buffalo and do this. Buffalo doesn't have a weekly open mic. So I did my due diligence and did an open mic for three years until I moved. And in 2004, this is a true story. I was going through something and the words, in the midst of it all came to me. And that's where that was birthed. And the first in the midst of it all poem was entitled Fear. Wow. And that was June 8th, 2004. And the rest, as they say, is history. That's awesome. Well, you do such an amazing job and you speak about a lot of topics that are relative. And so that really is always helpful. I know that you've written some amazing Black history poems and you've written poems for many different um, holidays and occasions. And so it's really been um, very wonderful for you to do that and to be a part. So I thank you so much for coming mm -hmm. on and for sharing and being with us um, on the Carla Murphy Show for truly, you are uniquely different. Thank you, thank you. Thank it's you. a pleasure and an honor to uh, be on your show and read poetry in front of like-minded poets. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. Next up, we have Mr. Keenan Glover. And we are so happy that he has come to be a part of the Kyla Murphy Show, Uniquely Different, where we know him as a distinguished Toastmaster. He is the president of the Sylvester Anderson Voices to be Heard Club and he's in the Rochester, New York area. We are just so happy that he is always willing to share. He is an amazing speaker. I will never forget when I heard you speak about broken bones. And so Mr. Keenan Glover, <laughs> it's just so awesome for you to be here. You're not a stranger to the Carla Murphy Show and I'm thankful that you have taken the time to come and share with us. So I know that you're going to enlighten us and entertain us as you share this evening. Good evening, welcome, and take it away, Mr. Keenan Glover. Certainly to Kyla Murphy, thank you for this honor to be a reoccurring appearance on your show. I do not take it lightly. It is certainly a pleasure to be here. To my fellow guests that I'm with, to the producer of this show, Certainly, thank you for being here and having me tonight once again. A little bit about my poetry background before I read my piece. I really didn't give poetry a try until 2012, my senior year of high school. I was on the bus one day and I heard a song, a, a beat to a rap song, just the beat, no lyrics, the instrumental. And I began to write and write a nice rap song and it just flowed from there. And once I graduated high school and went out to Howard University, it was there I opened up uh, so many talents. I started to sing more. I rapped in a freestyle battle once. Wow. I began to write poetry and express those words to people like-minded, you know, just like we are here today in a room full of black people. I've never experienced that before growing up in a suburban school. So I grew up in the urban setting, but I moved at a young age. So to go to Howard and experience what pure blackness is, is awesome. So when I got to Howard, I was not scared to venture out and try different things. And poetry was one of those things. And I can truly say that it is a journey. It is an experience. And it is certainly a lifestyle. Wow. Without wow. further ado. I will read Concrete Cracks. The concrete cracks have my imperfections showing, yet I'm open like a rose and my roots are steady growing. Don't tell me I ain't beautiful. Can't you see? Don't tell me I ain't proper. Can't you speak? There's more than one way to live life. And there's only one person that can live mine. So don't leave me to go bother someone else's life. I'm on a track towards divine destination. There is no looking back, forward, just this moment, no hesitation. Hesitation is too expensive. I can't afford it. It's out of my reach to be beneath. Because you see, I am from above and not from below. I am somebody. I may not be your cup of tea, but people would still sure shop for me. So just because you are picked once does not mean that you are worth nothing. It's something to be someone born from a man and a woman. We didn't ask to be here, but we do have choices. And the choices are so important. One wrong move can take us down, but do not stay down. Get back up and turn things around. The odds are in our favor. So I like to dress up so they think that I am Bougie. I like to speak knowledge and power that makes folks wish that they knew me. No, I am no newbie. 
I'm seasoned like a fish fry. I've got more swag than any scallywag. That's my brains. Can't I weigh my past? It took a whole lot to get me here. This stretch isn't over. We just got here. Taking advantage of every opportunity. You can just say that's the distinguished Toastmaster within me. I speak and I have spoken. You heard me once for the message. That's not me being cocky or stuck up. I'm just a distinguished Toastmaster. And that is what's up. The concrete cracks. Thank you. I had to do the jazz hands. I had to do the jazz hands. Now I can snap. <laughs> <laughs> we know the Toastmasters, they taught me you do the jazz hands. So Jazz hands, that's right. That was This is awesome. actually how you clap in sign language. I love it. Mr. Keenan, thank you so much for sharing. Oh, that problem. was amazing. It's my pleasure. And it's, it's awesome how you started your, your journey. And so being a public speaker, is there any advice that you can share with the listeners and the viewers about the best way to speak when you prepare a poem? I am so glad that you asked that question. Especially for a poem, it's all about the eye contact. And if eye contact is intimidating to you, this one thing take away from this advice I'm giving to you. Here. You look here, and it gives off the vibe as if you're looking them in the eye. Look them in between the eye, just above the nose. That is my tip, number one. Number two, practice. Study your notes. Study your script so that you can anticipate the next word that is coming up, so that you can have a cadence to your speech. Vocal variety is key. You want to bring it up. You want to bring it back down. You want to slow your words. Speed it up a bit and bring it back. It's all about wordplay. Wordplay, wordplay, wordplay. If you have too many W's here, it's fine. Alliteration. If you want to break it up, do so as well. It is your backyard. It is your playground. It is your world when it comes to poetry. And speaking it in public can take you to a whole nother level. Thank you so much, Mr. Keenan. That was powerful. And I learned look between the eyes. And so I'm going to hold on to that. It's look between the eyes and the word play. That, that was really something to think about, some food for thought. Yes, because you know how sometimes you can look at somebody and you think you're giving eye contact going from left eye to right eye, but you can actually tell they're looking you from your left eye to your right eye. That is why you stay focused on one spot. <laughs> I love that. I, I really like the idea of vocal variety is key yes. as well. So that's going to stick with me. And I believe that's going to help to make all of us better speakers and presenters. So Mr. Keenan Glover, thank you so much for coming and sharing yet again on the Carla Murphy show, Uniquely Different. For truly, you. you are uniquely different. Oh, and you are too. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. I would not dare move forward before we hear from our producer, Ms. Brenda Billups, who is going to give us a little bit this evening. But Mr. Martin Bryant, I, I need to hear some advice from you for our listeners and viewers on preparation for poetry. Um, advice. Um, just be confident in what you write because you, you wrote it. It's your, however, whether it's five lines, 10 lines, whether it rhymes, doesn't rhyme, whether it's controversial, spiritual, it's yours. Poetry and any type of creative writing is yours. Like music, if you write a song, that's your song. So be confident in your words and that'll come out in your delivery. And one other thing, believe in what you say. Whether you're speaking it to one person, 100, 
or a thousand people believe in what you say. And that all comes out in your delivery. Like Keenan said, your cadence, your presentation. If you don't believe in what you say, you're not going to look that person in the eye or in the center. You're going to look down. You're going to, you're going to stumble. You're going to, they're going to know, oh, he just wrote this or she just wrote this just to get up on the mic. So I, I think if, if I was to say anything, just believe it and have confidence and believe in yourself and everything else falls into play. You'll get the claps, the snaps. People will say, good job. You know, you'll get your connections. Just believe it. I like that. Thank you very, very much. This is some outstanding advice that we've heard this evening. And I know that we're all going to be better because of it and put it into practice. And I don't know, I, I better watch out and be careful, Miss Brenda, because I have some people who may be trying to take my place, you know. So I have to stay on point and make sure that I'm doing the right thing and looking between the eyes and being confident and making sure that I believe in what I say and say what I believe. So thank you, gentlemen, for sharing. Ms. Brenda Billups, our producer, we're just so happy to have her on with us this evening. And she is also a distinguished Toastmaster. She is a leader in her own right in District 65. She is um, going to take us a little bit further. And I know that she has some amazing advice to give and to share as well. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, Ms. Brenda. Thank you so much for all that you do. Hello to all of you. I am not a poet. I almost lost my life trying to be a poet. I was raised in a religious home and at the dinner table, it was my turn to say my Bible verse. And I said, Jesus wept, Peter crept, Moses fell out the back doorstep. I lost my chance to dinner. I had to leave the table. Why did I say that? Because we had been saying that all along, playing with my friends. So Jesus wept and Moses fell out the back doorstep. That was the end of the poetry for me. However, most of the fellows back in my day, back in the 60s and the 70s, when they were trying to pick up a chick, they would always say, roses are red, violets are blue. And they would add anything they thought would fit those lines. So I said, that's not for me. Those are not poetic lines. And they are not yours in the first place. So why are you repeating something that's not yours? Be creative. Go and do something for yourself. So I admire poets. My daughter used to like to write poetry. And my son, Chaz, the one that passed on, he wrote his mom a poem for Mother's Day. You know how they would ask kids to write a poem? And I have two I would like to read. He said, Mom, thank you, poem. I love you. I love you. Thank you for food, clothes. Mm -hmm. And to have you, I love you very much. I give you, no, I love you and you are very nice. Love, son, Chaz, Coase, Billups. And that's what kids used to love to write. Aww. But I like living. And I said, the life you live is not your own. The breath you breathe may not be for long. The steps you may take are allowed you to make. The love you spread is because he said. The hate you may have was not you to grab. The life you live is the life he gives. So I had to be careful with my life because your mom would always tell you, I brought you in this world and I would take you out. <laughs> so I had to take these words at heart. My life is not my own. Because when she felt like that she would take it away, 
I had to be careful. So Jesus didn't weep anymore. <clears throat> Peter didn't tip anymore. And Moses stayed on the porch. Thank you very much, Carla Murphy, for being uniquely different. Thank you so much, Ms. Brenda, for sharing with us today. I wouldn't dare put you through listening to my poetry. So I'll pass on that and save that for another show. <laughs> but thank you so much for sharing. And that was a beautiful tribute to the memory of Chaz. And so I know that um, you are a proud mom and your children, they love you to pieces and we love you to pieces. And we're so grateful for all that you do to help us to be who we are with the Kyla Murphy Show, Uniquely Different. So thank you so much, Miss Brenda. We are preparing to move forward and we have a special guest who has joined us, Mr. Bruce George. Good evening, Mr. Bruce. Good evening, Carla, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm blessed, I'm blessed, how's everybody? All is well. We are yeah. so happy to have Mr. Bruce George, who is the founder of the Geniuses Common Movement and co-founder of HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam. He is a Peabody Award winner. He's a visionary, an executive producer, writer, quotologist, entrepreneur, editor, author, intellectual, a mentor, educator, poet, and an activist. Mr. Bruce George has written many, many poems and different quotations. And I'm going to share a few of my favorite quotations by Mr. Bruce George. One of them is, there's nothing more powerful than knowing your purpose, wearing your own name, clocking your own clock, and answering to no one but God. Another one of the quotes that I really, really like at one time, we were placeholders for someone else. And now it's someone else's turn. And finally, I will share another quote that really, really resonated in my spirit. Every accident is on purpose. We're so happy to have with us this evening, Mr. Bruce George, and we're going to hear a bit about his life. And Mr. Bruce, thank you so much so much for taking the time to come and share with me on the Carla Murphy show for truly you are uniquely different. I am so happy to be a part of the Geniuses Common Movement. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. It has been life changing. It is definitely Amen. amazing. It helps to build one's confidence. It helps us to share our greatness. And truly, we all know genius is common. So Absolutely. Mr. Bruce Absolutely. George, well, thank, thank you, you for again. having me. Yeah, thank you I, for having I'm, me. I'm grateful to have you here with us. So let me ask you a few questions. We're going to talk a little bit about your childhood. Okay. Where did you grow up? Yeah, I was born in Harlem, uh, raised in the Bronx. Uh, I've lived in Brooklyn for over 15 years. I'm a New Yorker to the umpteenth percentile. But first and foremost, Carla, I want to thank the good Lord for blessing us to be here. I'd like to always Amen. pay homage to our Heavenly Father. And I want to thank you for having me on your Carla Murphy Uniquely Different thank show. You. And I want to thank everybody that's watching in, uh, whether live or through the archive. I want to thank them for uh, zooming in. And I appreciate you. And so I was, I was born in Harlem. I was, I was born in Harlem um, and raised in the Bronx. And uh, I'm a New Yorker to the umpteenth percentile, as they would say. <laughs> <laughs> so as a kid, what were you like? Tell us about it. Um, as a, as a child, I was very impressionable. Um, living in the Bronx, where I was at, it was it was a nice neighborhood per se, but like a lot of cities, you know, you have your elements. You know, we had our elements in my neighborhood. You know, a lot of the buildings were abandoned and all that good stuff, and so we turned them into playhouses. And you know, we did what we needed to do. You know, so the environment was pretty rough. But as a child, you really don't even, you don't, you don't have that sense of mortality yet. So for us, it was just, we were just rolling with the punches, no pun intended, and just enjoying ourselves. So it was, it was a rough environment, per se. You know, a lot of gang culture was happening around that time. Uh, but at the same token, I guess I had the cloak of being, you know, young, where, you know, I wasn't aware of just how dangerous, dangerous it was because I was just busy just doing my thing 
uh, with my uh, fellow comrades, if you will. <laughs> All right. So as a kid, what did you want to be when you grow up? Um, I wanted to, I wanted to, um, believe it or not, I wanted to be an intellectual, you know, didn't want to be a cop, didn't want to be a, you know, whatever. I've, I've always fell in love with words, always fell in love with people that, you know, just could really just, just great thinkers, you know? And um, when I, as, as a child, I was reading books, but people that have PhDs next to the names or MDs next to the name, I was just very curious. At one time, they used to call me Curious George. I was just a very curious child. And so, um, you know, I wanted to just really just be a conversationalist, be somebody that could just really just hold a great conversation and just be this, one of the smartest people in the room. Well, you definitely have proven to do and to be that. So thank you so <laughs> much. <laughs> you, you. you have a way of putting words together and it's definitely a gift from God and it, it's phenomenal. So thank Amen. you. Amen. So when when so. you were in school, what was your favorite subject and what kind of student were you? Um, when I was in elementary school, um, I really didn't have a favorite subject. Um, it's not until I went to Samuel Gompas High School uh, that I was able to get into the trades and stuff like that. But I wound up getting kicked out of Samuel Gompas High School for inciting a riot between the Blacks and Puerto Ricans. You know, I was very cantankerous as a child, very impressionable, um, and just very angry, you know, um, as a result of not having my father in my life, you know. So I was one of those Black children that had that anger. And we would take that anger out, unfortunately, on ourselves and others around us, you know. So I was pretty, pretty, you know, when I was in high school, I was pretty, uh, pretty rough and, you know, impressionable and, and did some things that I'm not proud of, but I'm not ashamed of at the same token. We all have. So I do, I do understand that. Absolutely. So as we shift gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit more about um, your life journey, um, I'm interested in hearing. So I know that you have some affiliation with the Buffalo, New York area, and we know right. that's an amazing place to be. So exactly. can you talk a little bit about your time spent well. in this area? Sure. Well, when I got kicked out of high school, semi Gompers High School for Incite the Riot, um, I wind up, instead of going to jail, I went to Job Corps. And then when I went to Glenmar Job Corps, yeah, well, I was at Job Corps, I was fighting, punching windows out, and just bugging, you know, um, so minor drugs while I was there, but somebody believed in me and they said, you know what, this guy has outstanding academics. So they didn't kick me out. So I graduated from there. And then from there, I, I went to Niagara University's new art program. It's called Niagara University Opportunity Program. So big up to them. And I wound up going there for five years and I wound up graduating and that turned my whole life around. So actually getting kicked out of high school saved my life. Because from there, I went to Job Corps. And from Job Corps, I went to college and graduated from that university. And I minored in psychology and majored in philosophy. Love that. So I mean, I'm sorry, majored in philosophy. I mean, majored in philosophy and minored in psychology. It's the opposite way around. Oh, okay. I mean, no, majored in, no, majored in psychology and minored in philosophy. Now I got it right. So you truly have mm -hmm. always been a thinker. I, I really believe that. Absolutely. So Absolutely. what inspires you? What inspires me life. You know, um, you know, I just, I look around me, I see how the playing field is not even. And to be honest with you, that's what inspires me to, to level the playing field. You know, so I definitely have that Panther, that Black Panther spirit in me, you know, and I've always been drawn to activists always drawn to people that are about making a difference. You know, um, you know, I'll come out of gang culture as well. So I was drawn to anyone that was about rebelling against the system. You know, I was drawn to them. You know, so one time it was in gangs and then as I graduated out of that, then it became grassroots movements and organizations, which is not uncommon because the Panther Party was full of ex-gang members, mm -hmm. right? You know, a lot of those people that are in the party, in the party at the time, they, they were they were gang members. The same thing with the Nation of Islam. A lot of people that are in the Nation of Islam at one time were gang members or drug addicted or whatever. So 
you know, that's what I'm more, one thing more often to the other for me. All right. So we know that you're you're so humble and and we're I'm grateful for for your spirit of humbleness. But we know that you're a celebrity in your own right. And having had the opportunity to share in a major way to be on HBO and to do all of those things, what does it feel like being a celebrity? Um the typical question or the typical answer would be I don't feel like one. Um, I know that I'm known around the world, respected around the world, and I thank God for that. And I put a lot of work in to receive those accolades and for people to receive me the way I am. You know, a good name is better than Troy Silver, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and Amen. so I work very hard to keep my nose clean and keep myself out of trouble and just really not, you know, be the way I was in my past. You know, but it feels great to be able to know that I have influence or sway over thousands upon thousands of people around the globe and people that say it doesn't feel good they're lying they're being very disingenuous it feels great to be able to be known around the world respected around the world lauded around the world but i always put that in the perspective of the fact that it's because of god's grace that i'm in this position and it's not about me it's about him right and it's not about the i it's about the we it's not about the individual it's about the collective that everybody's work is their ministry. You know, my work is my ministry. You know, social activism is one of my work ministries that I have, you know. Um, everything I do is revolved around activism and my social ministry. So yeah, I mean, the celebrity piece is, is great. It feels great and, you know, and I know what to do with it and, I'm not, and I know how to handle it. Truly indeed you do. So if you could pass on one message for your fans, what message would that be? Well, I'm a master quotologist. Um, I don't like to use the word fan. Um, I said a fan is nothing but an admirer off of his or her meds. And so, um, you know, as far as the people that admire my work, the message would be, you know, like Garvey said, up you mighty people, you can accomplish what you will. And for your audience, um, you know, um, about myself, just a little bit in terms of where I come from as far as my academ academic goes. You know, I've, I'm into psychology, philosophy, classic literature, neurolinguistic programming, metaphysics, body language, the law of attraction. I specialize in power. I'm a wordsmith, word engineer, and a master quotologist. I'm quoted around the world every nanosecond of every single day. Thousands of my own quotes and the quotes that I have the memory of others is staggering. And it's not because of who I am, it's because of whose I am, mm -hmm. right? There's no such thing as extraordinary people it's ordinary people that do things extraordinarily well. And so, um, you know, I just, love to, I just love to write. I love to educate. I love to be educated. You know, um, Frederick Nietzsche said it best. I know everything because I know nothing, right? So I love to stay in a state, in that state, so that affords me the opportunity to not rest upon my laurels so I can continue to educate myself and in turn educate others. That's great. That's great. Thank you. So let's, sh let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the Geniuses Common movement. So as okay. the founder of Geniuses Common, um, the, the movement that you have, what's the most challenging role that you've ever taken on, whether it be the founder or a recruiter, the organizer or a promoter or something else? Um, all of the above was challenging because whenever you start anything new, um, you're going to always get resistance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's been said the truth goes through three stages. First, it is ridicule. Then it is violently opposed. Then it is accepted as self-evident. So it's not until people reach that third stage that they want to jump on things or become a part of things. And we call those people bandwagoners. So during that process, you know, you're going to get a lot of resistance. You know, you're going to get a lot of doubt and Thomases. You're going to get a lot of people that's going to be like, yeah, it sounds nice, but you only have three videos. So it sounds nice, but you only have three people involved in the movement. Call me when it breaks mainstream. Then why would I call you when it breaks mainstream if you're not going to be there for me when it's, mm -hmm. I'm on my come up? I never could figure that out, you know, nor did I try to figure that out. So, um, yeah, so the Genius is Coming movement basically um, is the first movement that, uh, that basically put the word genius on trial, metaphorically speaking. We're the first movement to tear down the Berlin Wall of the word genius and put it in the hands of the people where it belongs. So you take a young lady from a housing project, the micro braids hair like Picasso painted, that's a genius. Dave Chappelle is a genius of a comedian. 
Bishop T.D. Jakes is a genius of a bishop. So we're the first movement to take the elitism out of the word genius, right? Thus, we are an anti-elitist movement. And so it got started from one of my quotes because I would go around the country and I would ask the youth, when you hear the word genius, what image comes to mind? And they would always say Einstein or a light bulb and call it every now and then I would get a Jordan and that troubled me. And I said, you know what? Let me write a quote about that. And the quote is, notwithstanding Einstein or in spite of Einstein, genius is common. And then that turned into the slogan, genius is common, which turned into an entire movement. And as we speak, we have a presence in all 50 states, 14 countries with 26 ambassadors and growing. So big up to everybody that's in the genius is common movement starting with you, Carla, and all of my 26 ambassadors, all of the partners and everything, as well as the 70 celebrities that actually did Genius Is Coming videos. Mm -hmm. You know, actor Malik Yoba, Nikki Giovanni, The Last Poets, the late Tommy Ford from The Martin Lawrence Show. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on to the break of dawn. So, and the movement is basically letting the world know that the word genius applies to every last one of us. And it came from the word genie, which is the tutelary spirit within a person so the genius in us is the genie in us, and the genie in us is the God in us we've been lied to. You know, look at the word genie in Genesis. Genesis is the beginning. God is the alpha and the omega. Look at the word genie in your genes. Your genes is your whole makeup, right? So the cat is out the bag and the jig is up. We're the first movement to take the elitism out of the word genius. Thus, we are an anti-elitist movement. All right. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. So... What is your dream collaboration? I know that you partner with a lot of people all over this world, but what's your dream collaboration? Uh, it would be to, because we have, uh, we're a YouTube video based movement and we have 70 celebrities that would, for me to answer that would be for me to have certain celebrities that would like to be and do geniuses coming videos. LeBron James is one of them. You know, um, I would love to get, um, of course, uh, uh, president Obama and Michelle Obama. Um, they're still my president as far as I'm concerned. He's still my president as far as I'm concerned. And she's still my first lady as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, people like that, you know, just people that are just really just making a, a headway and, and, and have a big name for themselves that could really spread the movement further. You know, people that are just really doing their thing. Great. I know that you are so modest, but can you just share with us, Mr. Bruce, about how many people are a part of the Geniuses Common Movement? I would say hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, because the movement uh, has a presence, again, in all 50 states, 14 countries with 26 ambassadors and growing. So we have a presence in Jamaica, Barbados, Ghana, Kenya, Dubai, Norway, Nigeria, the UK, Canada, the Bahamas. We're about to have a presence in the Dominican Republic and Panama. Um, I'm the head honcho. I run everything and I own everything. You know, I own the trademark, I own the copyright, and I'm the only Facebook group administrator because you have to keep this close to the belt. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're doing well. Our, our TikTok has gone viral um, and we average a like a minute. Uh, we have over 231,000 likes with over 300 videos. And uh, our Facebook group has over 21,600 members, which is not bad for a Facebook group. And so where YouTube... Um, Facebook, TikTok-based movement. And uh, we're about to break mainstream any day, hour, a month now, like Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movements, respectively. And we even have a video from Tarana Burke, who is the founder of the Me Too movement. That's awesome. Thank so you. do you have any rituals that you carry out before any of your shows or any of your presentations that you do? Um, no rituals, um, but I do have a ritual. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I think, my Lord and Savior, yes. for blessing me to wake up in the morning, um, as I thank the good Lord for blessing us to be here together. And then after that, I meditate. Not every day, but I do meditate for the most part. So that's a part of my ritual. You know, I wake up by God's grace in my prayer, meditate, you know, get my shower in, you know, boom, 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 whatever, do my thing, and then start the day and then just make things happen. Because I'm a firm believer, Carla, that your work is your ministry. Yes. You know, you cannot rest on your laurels. You know, um, Dr. Oh. Miles Monroe said it best. We weren't meant to die old. We were meant to die finished. Right? You know, and I don't even like to use the word die. I like to say we were meant to transition mm -hmm. when we have been finished. Right? Because we don't die, we transition. You know, to be absent from the bodies, to be what? Present, Present with the Lord. That's Absolutely. Right. right? 
Thank you so much. So if you. you could pick a theme song that would describe where your life is right now, what song would you choose and why? Mm, what song would I choose and why if I could? Um, hmm. uh, I would say uh, Bob Marley's uh, Liven Up Yourself. I don't know if that's the exact, you know, liven up yourself. Boom, 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 boom. I'm not a singer. <laughs> you know, just, just liven up yourself because you have to, you have to always, um, you know, keep yourself alive and rich with motivation because the evil one uh, will try to come kill, steal, and destroy your energy, mm -hmm. destroy your work ministry, destroy your passion, right? He do anything he can to try to separate you from God, to separate you from your ministry. And I'm a firm believer that your work is your ministry. You know, God has this amazing sense of humor where he gives us the so-called free will to do what we want to do, but the fine print reasons that you do what I instilled in you to do, you'll never be happy and you'll never have purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, and, and I'm a firm believer in that, that we were all born to carry out his work ministry in some shape, form, or fashion. You know, there are a lot more ordained ministers out of church than in church. Um, you see somebody flipping burgers, that's an ordained minister. You see somebody cleaning the toilets, that's an ordained minister. You see somebody, a doorman, that's an ordained minister. You know, so there are a lot more ordained ministers out of church than in church, for sure. And these are great questions, by the way, and I love questions. Thank you so much. I'm so excited that you've taken the time to come and share. And I know you've been an amazing, amazing, phenomenal, outstanding mentor to me. And so I, I thank you so that. much for the friendship and for the push. I'm humble. And you've seen, even in a short period of time, you've seen in me what I didn't know was inside of me myself. And so I am just grateful for you, you, Mr. Bruce George, being a part of my life and sharing and encouraging and helping us as we build and helping us as we grow. So you. you being such a phenomenal leader, as we begin to wrap up for today, do you have any advice that you can give to young people in particular who are part of the viewers and listening audience about how they can reach and fulfill their dreams? Right. Um, I have a great question. Um, first and foremost is to develop a relationship with God. Yes. Because when you develop a relationship with your Lord and Savior or your God, whatever you want to call him, when you have a relationship with God, what that does is it, 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 it gives you like a guide. God will guide you, right? Um, that's why he says, lean not towards your own understanding, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. So when you have a relationship with God, what he does is he guides you. He will guide your path right, throughout life, you know, and he will, you know, when you pray for something, he will guide you in the right direction, if it's his will, mind you, mm -hmm. that you can achieve that, you know, and I would say that I'm having a relationship with God, I would say that I'm also believing in yourself, you know, don't put any limits on yourself, you know, um, God, we said it best, up you mighty people, you can accomplish what you will, you know, and I would say to them that don't do things because it makes money, do things because you are passionate about it. Yeah. Do things because you your heart is there, you know. And nine out of ten times, usually whatever you are good at, that's what you were called to do. That's what you were ordained to do, right? So start paying attention to yourself and get a feel of it. What is it that I'm pretty good at? Well, if you're good at counting or accounting, then you're an accountant. You know, if you're very good at solving people's problems, then you're a psychologist. Right, stay away from psychiatry because of the drugs. That's a whole nother conversation, you know. But just start looking inside yourself to get a feel of what it is that you're most passionate about. And when you find out what it is, go after it with all fervor. You know, don't put no limits on yourself. Pray over it. Work towards it. You know, uh, Frederick Douglass said the best: "Power concedes nothing without a demand. Never did, and never will." Mm -hmm. Wow, that's thought provoking. Thank you so much for sharing that. that. It really Appreciate is. So Mr. Appreciate Bruce, I can't let you leave us today without hearing at least a couple more of your favorite quotes. Okay. Poem that you've written that you'd like to share. Okay, we'd love to um, share some quotes. But one of my favorite quotes is from Bob Marley though. 
Okay. Uh, I could share some of mine. One of my favorite co- quotes of his is, he says, the truth is everyone's going to hurt you. Mm. It's about finding the one worth suffering for. Wow. One of my favorite quotes is, no matter how low you keep your wickedness, karma knows how to limbo. Um, I wrote another quote where I said, she's dressed in Gucci, but her attitude is payless. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we know some of those. I wrote yeah. another quote where I said, when churches become concerts, pastors will become ticket masters. Mm. Exactly. You know, and behind every ticket master is a ticket slave. You know, so that's just a few of some of my quotes that I like uh, to share with the world. And as far as a poem goes, um, I like this one. Fatherless sons cries on the inside, dies on the inside with lump in throat, chokes on abandonment, then throws up gang sons. Wow. Yeah. Appreciate the snaps. You know? <laughs> and I would implore your audience to go to our website, geniusiscommon.com, um, where they can see amazing videos, starting with yours, Thank Carla, you, you know, you. and others. And they can visit our TikTok on geniusiscommon. You know, Genius is Common on TikTok and go to our website, geniusiscommon.com. They can check out all those amazing 975 plus videos and, and 70 of those are A-lister and B-lister celebrities as well as regular common folk that's sharing with the world their geniuses. And I want to thank everybody in the Geniuses Coming Movement, albeit uh, our ambassadors, our partners, such as you, Carl, and others, admirers, haters, thanking everybody, you know, um, that plays some role in Geniuses Coming being a massive success, starting with the good Lord, not only above, but inside of us, because God is inside of us. You know, not so much outside of us. He's inside of us. Luke 17, 21, saying you're low here and low there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Thank you again. This has been an amazing show. And I have to just say it. I have to say it. I have to say it. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And so this has been an amazing show. I feel enlightened, enriched. We've been entertained. We've had some outstanding poetry um we've had some nice. stories that people have shared and i'm just so thankful to each of you for coming and sharing and making this show what it is so to mr martin bryant mr keenan glover to miss brenda billups my producer to you my friend my mentor and an outstanding outstanding community activist mr bruce george we thank just you thank you all so much you are welcome and we're just looking forward to highlighting highlighting more of your greatness thank if you, you have not become a part of the geniuses common movement you are missing a real treat and i have to say that my logos were designed by one of the ambassadors for and from the Genius. Renata Brown, yes. So <laughs> I definitely believe in believe in you and believe in all that you've done for people. So thank you very it's much. It's been amazing. Thank you so much for coming and sharing. My pleasure. I am your host, Carla A. Murphy. This has been the Carla Murphy Show, uniquely different. For truly, each of you are uniquely different. We come together to grow, earn, and learn. So let's gel. Thank you again. God bless you all until we meet again. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. See you later. Peace.